As we opened the conference uh, yesterday, I, I mentioned that I had a sense there was a new level of excitement in the air to discuss the kinds of issues we've been discussing this weekend. And I must admit that I had no idea how rich the conversation would be. I uh, have enjoyed these panels enormously. We had planned uh, to, to have a, uh, a, a kind of a reflection panel uh, where we brought up a, a few of the participants, a few of the panelists, to simply reflect on uh, what has occurred over the last couple of days. As we thought about this, it seemed uh, perhaps it would be more productive to, rather than look back, I think we're, we're all, we will all be reflecting on this over the next several days, so rather than look back, why not look forward and uh, ask a few of the panelists to make some very brief comments on where uh, they see the possibilities for the future. Where do we go from here uh, in these many different disciplines that we've brought together? What are the kinds of approaches? What are the approaches individually? Uh, what are they uh, jointly? What are some of the questions that we may be able to ask that will productively move this, uh, this whole area forward? And so I'd, I'd like to start with uh, Owen, and we'll just have some brief comments and then a little bit of time for discussion uh, among the panelists. Thank you very much. Um, okay, uh, yes, we, uh, over lunch we um, sort of reoriented uh, ourselves and uh, were asked to, to speak for two minutes, I think it's a splendid idea, about uh, future directions. Now, the que a question is, of course, future directions for what? For this conversation, this kind of conversation, or whatever. Um, so let me just uh, give uh, really one idea, but I'll, uh, it requires some linkage, and I think it will only take two minutes. And it's actually quite specific. Uh, what I want to do is make a suggestion about how to extend the conversation that we've had over the last two days, but actually particularly the one that we had at the very end, um, to an area which is um, hot and big uh, in contemporary psychology, but is quite new. And what I have in mind here is a field called positive psychology. Um, they need us and we need them. Uh, and here's, here's what I want to say. Um, the, um, the panel that just ended was talking about the um, perennial, uh, constantly repeated problem about um, the connections between um, the conception of a an individual flourishing, conception of individual flourishing with uh, being good, with um, social and political justice, um, how, we, how we do all this together. And I do think it's the case that um, uh, there are many philosophical traditions, I'm speaking about, even though I'm a philosopher, I'm using philosophy here in a very, very broad sense, spiritual, philosophical traditions, which have incredible wisdom um, coincidentally, the three that I'm most familiar with, uh, classical Chinese philosophy, Greek, and uh, Buddhist, um, all occur about the same time. Uh, and uh, there's great um, wisdom, and, uh, but coming from different directions. Now, what I've just referred to as positive psychology is um, a research program that really is just about five or six years old um, within psychology. And um, I think... Uh, it's either going to turn out well or badly, and it will depend on how broad a kind of a conversation the psychologists um, engage themselves in and sort of uh, whether people of the sort that are in this room, uh, how they engage them. What I have in mind is this. There's basically um, Marty Seligman, who's one of the, who's the eminence grise um, of this field. Well, he's kind of bald, so he's quite, I don't know if he's gray or not. Um, but, um, this movement is concerned in a particularly American way with happiness, having noted that um, if you do research literature, if you uh, do studies of the literature in psychology, you'll see that the number of papers in scientific journals devoted to um, unhappiness, depression, things like that, outnumber by 100 to 1 um, papers on um, happiness and its causes, as we would say in, in Buddhism, uh, its content causes constituents, uh, that sort of thing. Um, and um, so there's a discussion of what uh, we, in, uh, following Aristotle, would call conceptions of eudaimonia, uh, what constitutes individual group and group flourishing. 
Now we already have, in addition to positive psychology, practices like psychotherapy, clinical psychology, behavioral and cognitive therapy. Um, but now there's this research going on and uh, uh, on neural correlates of happiness and well-being, uh, and now studies of subjective well-being, hedonic well-being, psychological well-being. This is out there, and I could, so one very profitable and simple thing I could see us doing was next time around, wherever this conversation goes and takes place, invite some of these psychologists, they're mostly psychologists, um, and have a conversation with them and uh, uh, where we can learn from them some about how they are trying to study happiness, make them more, as has come up, self-reflective about um, the fact that they're living within a tradition with a certain number, a uh, conception of happiness. You saw me yesterday superscripting all things like Buddhism, Dalai Lama type Buddhism, Owen Buddhism. Um, I think when you talk about happiness or flourishing, which is, of course, we have compassion first, and then, uh, at least according to the uh, wild Celtic uh, Roman Catholic Buddhism that I practice, uh, um, and I've heard that some other Buddhists have adopted this, um, compassion is to alleviate suffering, um, loving kindness is to bring flourishing in its stead. The conception of flourishing has to be um, very, very well uh, laid out. And uh, um, uh, there's always the danger, because we're talking about the USA, that it's happy, happy, joy, joy, click your heels. That's what the superscript says. That isn't the kind of happiness that most of the wisdom traditions have um, gone for. So I make a practical proposal. Bring those people in, bring, us, bring them to us, uh, a, a distinguished young uh, person that feels in the audience and will be at the reception and you can ask her all follow-up questions. Kristen Neff. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, uh, I wanted to start off by saying a little something about the last question that um, uh, Jay and Bob Pollack were dealing with the question of whether suffering arose from evil, deliberately chosen evil, or from ignorance. And it reminded me of an episode on the Rocky and Bullwinkle show. Actually, it was a whole series of episodes where they were trying to get something called the Kerwood Derby. And whoever had the Kerwood Derby, what they were, it would be they'd become the smartest person in the whole world. So Boris Badenov was trying to get the Kerwood Derby for about 25 episodes. He finally got it. You know, he figured then he'd be able to rule the world because he'd be the smartest one. And he put it on his head and he said, Tasha, I just realized, you know, this is crazy. He says, I'm not going to be happy if I rule the world. You know, why don't we just get married, settle down, and get a nice job somewhere? You know, and then he threw the hat off his head and said, phooey, if this is what being smart is, it isn't worth it. Now, you know, this seemed to be indicating that, you know, the question of whether evil comes from ignorance or whether it comes from, um, you know, deliberately choice, it kind of gets blurry. I mean, some people apparently choose to be stupid. I mean, this is my, my way we do it. And the reason this question is important, it becomes a question of how far do we want to expand this circle of people that we're talking to? Because one of the things, if you operate on the assumption that suffering comes from ignorance rather than evil, the difference between the way you react to ignorance and the way to evil, when you react to ignorance, what you try to do is you try to enlighten somebody, you try to talk to them, you try to persuade them. The way you do with evil is you either restrain them or you kill them. And you know, you not necessarily restrain them, kill them, or, or at best ignore them. And I know that certainly you know, we're creating a kind of consensus here of how to look at the world, you know, from some relatively diverse positions, but there's still an awful lot of positions that are being left out here. So the question is, how far do you want to extend this? I mean, who else might you want to invite to a conference like that? I mean, I thought until Bob Pollack came up here that, you know, two positions that were missing, missing were, you know, materialist absurdity and Christianity. He managed to combine both simultaneously in the same position. <laughs> Um, which was an accomplishment and, uh, you know, and for which there is also a tradition. I mean, he was definitely coming out of Kierkegaard's place for that. But, you know, I mean, what would this conference have been like if Dan Dennett had been here? You know, I mean, that's a good, you invited him? <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a good question. You know, certainly when we go, when Owen and I go to the Society for Philosophy and Psychology, the assumption, the, the default assumption is that everybody is an atheist materialist. I mean, the, the, the assumption is that no sane person would believe otherwise. And, you know, maybe at this point in the history of something like this, we need to simply get a better sense of what we believe ourselves. And I certainly, there's been a tremendous amount of that going on here, um, of, 
you know, because I mean, one of the things I really liked about this conference is that everybody changed their papers while delivering. You know, like there was a paper that was on the website, and then there was like a later person you'd see a later version that come along, and then by the time they're talking, everybody was saying, "Well, you think as Ned said this, and Bob said this, and and everybody had rewritten their papers to respond to everybody else right on the fly." And, and that was great, you know, I mean, usually the assumption is that nobody, you know, a lot of times, certainly in old line analytic philosophy, nobody ever changes anybody's minds, you know, I mean, it's just, you, you keep, you know, you've got the determinists and the free willists over here and they just go at it forever. And um, that's, that's a very encouraging thing. Um, perhaps that isn't possible unless, you know, we keep the circle stretched just enough so that you've got people that haven't talked to each other yet or not talked to each other enough yet who can create a new vision of some sort or do you stretch it even further? You know, if it's too small, you've got a, a mutual admiration society. If it's too big, there's a real danger that it's going to turn into a food fight, a shouting match. You know, and you know, if we had had some Orthodox Christians here, if we'd had some Muslims here, perhaps some Sufi Muslims, you know, who of course are having really serious trouble with the Wahhabi Muslims. Um, you know, the Sufis have converted most of the Muslims, particularly in South Asia, and you have. Wahhabi, you know, clerics being paid for with Saudi oil money going in and turning them all into fundamentalists when they used to be, you know, people that were happy, happily singing Kowali and saying that God was everywhere, you know, and, and worshiping uh, Sarasvati the way my Muslim teacher does. He's got a great big statue of Sarasvati, the Hindu god of music at, at the school where I study music. And all my, you know, all my music teachers have been Muslims, um, you know, even though there are a lot of other Muslims who think, you know, music is haram. So those moderate Muslims probably need a place, and there's certainly a lot of similarities in the Sufi tradition, you know, and the Buddhist tradition. Certainly with Sufi and Zen, there's a lot of tradition. So questions, I mean, that's really the question, and I think we have to ask ourselves when we look at that, where do we go from here is expand the circle. But when we do expand the circle, we're gonna have to think in terms of how far do we expand the circle, and those are the two issues that happen. If we extend it, expand it too far, um, it may, disintegrate, if we don't expand it far enough, it'll be a mutual admiration society and there's no real communication. And I'm, you know, I think that we have to use our judgment and our intuitions to figure exactly how far that circle expands. That's a question we're going to have to constantly keep in mind. Well, I have to say it's been a privilege and honor and really a great uh, pleasure to be part of this conference and the hats off to the organizers. Uh, Chris and Annabella, yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Just a fantastic amount of work has gone into this. And um, I can only respond really out of my own personal uh, subjectivity, I suppose, at this moment. And one thing that has struck me, I couldn't help but remember when I first began studying Tibetan Buddhism, uh, like many of you sitting here. None of our neighbors, certainly not our parents, had ever heard of it. Uh, one of my friends was asked by uh, her parents' best friend what she was doing, and she said, oh, I'm staying at a Buddhist monastery in New Jersey. And she said, you know, there was this dead silence. I felt like I'd given the wrong line in a play. <laughs> And to come from that corner of obscurity, you know, when we were just a group of rather odd people who didn't seem to be doing anything that any, anyone else in this culture had an interest in, to now be participants in this major cultural conversation, uh, thanks in large part to the curiosity of His Holiness the Dalai Lama and the hard work of people like Alan Wallace and many, many people who've been part of the mind and life, it's really a moment, it's a cultural moment that is just worth stating that to be the case. And at the same time, it's a moment of enormous promise. I feel that from my own perspective, people in this conference, as T just suggested, have been very generous, very open. And yet, no doubt, there are boundaries that we would still like to press against. Um, when I was part of the uh, conference at Stanford with His Holiness said, in November, one of, in preparation for the discussion, one of the uh, heads of the neurological side of the conference said, only half in jest, he said, well, you know, don't use the C word. That means consciousness. <laughs> and uh, Alan has given us a wonderful backdrop as to why that should have been a problem. 
And I feel that as we move forward, as this conversation moves, moves forward, which it seems bound to do, and very important that it does do so, that we might still press some further boundaries. We haven't talked a lot about other kinds of knowing besides intellectual understanding. Uh, we haven't talked a lot about some of the subtle energies of the body. There are many Buddhist traditions which uh, really define the transformation that they're after, not so much in, in terms of uh, an intellectual or, or any other kind of really cognitive understanding, but in terms of the, the energies in the body moving in a different way. And that would take us further from the paradigms that many of us are comfortable with, but in the spirit of exploration and curiosity and sheer courage, perhaps that's something in the next 150 years, I don't think we have to wait 30,000, uh, that we can be looking at. And I think that would be something very, very exciting for us to consider. Uh, the issue of representation that Teed mentioned, certainly I think that uh, my gender has been very well represented by the two other uh, women who were on these panels, but <laughs> I think we could see more of that. I think we could see more cultural diversity, racial diversity, um, which is not to greatly honor the diversity that is present in this, in this conference. Um, still, we can look to increase it. And um, the one other which um, was mentioned earlier, there's been a sub-theme here that maybe we don't want to get caught up only in looking at individuals. And I think that's something very important for us because from quantum physics to uh, Buddhist experience, there is, certainly a, there is certainly much to testify to the fact that there are many ways in which we're not individuals. And in fact, individual didn't even mean what it means today to be a part uh, until the 16th or 17th century when individuality in the West became a great uh, trope. Uh, it used to mean that which cannot be parted, like the Holy Trinity. So I think as we study ourselves, we want to study ourselves also in community. And we've uh, talked a lot about Buddha and Dharma so far, but we haven't talked a lot about Sangha in the sense of which the way community impacts uh, not only the intellectual understanding of a person in community, but the energies of that person also. One reason why chanting is so significant, for example. Um, and so as we study the bodies and brains of people in isolation, we might also want to look at how they're operated in community, and I, for one, greatly look forward to whatever of many possible wonderful directions this conversation will take. And again, thanks to all who've made this much possible. Um, I would also like to thank Chris and Annabella for inviting me and giving me this opportunity to be part of this very exciting and enriching conversation. Um, one of the, you can say, advantages or disadvantages of speaking last is that quite a lot of what you wanted to say is already being said, <laughs> and in many cases, in a more articulate way. Um, in fact, um, uh, the question of inclusiveness and how, how much to, how far to expand the circle for this conversation is a, is a very difficult one. It's a very challenging one. Uh, on the one hand, um, you know, one would like to be as inclusive and pluralistic as uh, possible, but at the same time, it creates a lot of problems, uh, practical and, and conceptual as well, because I've been personally part of various conversations, and um, uh, where the conversations have been most successful is when it's a dialogical part, you know, uh, 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 context. And then when there are more than two voices, it, the dialogue gets very complicated. So, um, so it's, it's just a practical um, consideration that we need to take very seriously. If we are going to expand the circle, it has to be done in a very thoughtful, careful way with the full awareness of what, you know, what it means in terms of actual prop, you know, practical issues and problems. Um, I was going to make a specific suggestion, but uh, either uh, Owen has um, uh, clairvoyance or, um, you know, 
you know, as, as the Tibetans say, we're both not very smart, we think alike, <laughs> as George pro pointed out. Um, only idiots think alike. That was the Tibetan expression in the debating courtyard. Um, so I was actually going to make a suggestion on this positive psychology. I've personally been very impressed by Seligman's work. And it also uh, looks very promising because, um, as he pointed out, uh, points out in his book, that um, much of Western psychological vocabulary has been really dominated by the clinical model. And uh, so what he would like to see, and he puts it very nicely, that he would like to see an equivalent of uh, this DSL for the positive, is it DSL, yeah? Um, DSM. DSM, yeah. He would like to see an equivalent of DSM for positive emotions, uh, which I think is a very interesting way of putting it. And the reason why I, as a Buddhist, and Buddhist uh, a scholar is very interested in this is uh, because I know the power of the dominance of scientific discourse. Um, effectively, when you think of clinical problems and pathologies, uh, psychological, you know, uh, psychiatric issues and psychopathologies, uh, DSM is the Bible, and, and it's that the language and the standard and so on is so dominant. And if ever uh, something equivalent to that is going to be pr produced for uh, positive emotions, emotions that pertain to experience of happiness, well-being, and so on, then uh, I fully agree with Owen. That process in the creation of that kind of uh, uh, manual or stan standardization really needs to be much more inclusive. It cannot be confined to a specific culture's uh, bias of what happiness consists of, uh, what kind of emotions are positive. And here, uh, I feel that uh, the contemplative traditions can make uh, a very significant contribution. And I can speak for my own uh, Buddhist, Indo-Tibetan Buddhist tradition. Um, in the uh, Indo-Tibetan Buddhist tradition, in, not just in the, the non-Mahayana Abhidhamma sources, but also in the Mahayana Abhidhamma sources. I'm particularly thinking of uh, the fourth century brothers Asanga and Vasubandhu, uh, in some sense we can refer to them as uh, kind of, you know, primary Buddhist uh, psychologists. I mean, if, if one can use the term in a loose way, um, they have uh, written quite extensively on many of these mental factors, their interrelationships, uh, what, you know, their definitions, their cause and effect dynamical relationships, and so on. And in fact, they also have programs or practices which can help enhance and cultivate and develop them. So, and some of these are empirical claims, but whatever it may be, I think in the, in the, in the formulation of the concept of what constitutes a positive emotions and what not, I think the, 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 the part, there has to be much more participation from different voices. And I know that one of uh, Alan's main uh, kind of, um, in some sense, a slogan is this, you know, human flourishing. Ellen wants to, you know, kind of uh, help, um, um, encourage um, the Western uh, philosophy of mind and, and psychological world to try to uh, re-appreciate the Greek concept of eudaimonia, so that the, the, the understanding of happiness is not just confined to just, you know, immediate sense gratification. So I just wanted to... It's interesting that in physics, we have a very clear concept of time. What we're missing in physics is a concept of now. We, we don't have a, a T prime or something that stands for now. So we talk about time, but we don't know what now is. Uh, flipping that over, culturally, we often are very absorbed in now, and we don't have a very good sense of time. Uh, so one question I would pose for, uh, our panelists here, or, or maybe some of the other panelists, uh, would be regard, in regard to our uh, uh, historical perspective. The one point that I've learned uh, listening to Alan and listening to Bob is that at various times in history, uh, we've ha there, have, there have been great schools of introspection and vast numbers of people uh, engaged in those practices. Uh, there's certainly many other periods of history where that was not true. 
My question would be with regard to first person investigations, with regard to the kinds of questions that are being raised here, where do we stand now in a, in a, a bit of a historical perspective? What's different about now? Why do we think we can approach this, the problems we've raised here differently? Uh, will we approach them in the same way? So I, I just would uh, address that to, to um, any of our panelists here or maybe some of the other panelists as well. Throw it out to the audience. <laughs> yeah, maybe it's the panelists don't have it. <laughs> Whenever I think about now, I think of the very recent past in that context. In the 20th century, it strikes me that it, it presents us with a, an awesome koan that in the 20th century, there was ex expe exponential growth of knowledge and power, the greatest success in the history of humanity in terms of this extraordinary growth of knowledge and power, the great fantastic success of science and technology, which in a way can give us ri gives rise to enormous celebration, as we've heard who wants to go back and die at the age of 40 and so forth and so on, on the one hand. And then the koan part is the 20th century was the worst century in, hi in history for the environmental de de degradation, for man's in inhumanity against man, the sheer slaughter and the, gen and the genocides, one after another, two major world wars, how we could know so much and be so powerful and be so maliciously idiotic is a great koan, I think. And so we, if we follow this trajectory, which we seems to be now for the first six years of this, this century, then it seems quite clear we're bent on self-destruction and bringing down a lot of the planet with us. So clearly this is a time of crisis and a time when, on a great big bulky level, there's a rise of very militant religious fundamentalism and so forth and so on. Very, very dire, very deeply concerning issues on the one hand. But if we come right to the present as well, I think there are other truths that are not as large and bulky, but maybe just as important, and which I see bright light. And that is in the history of religions, as so many people pointed out, religions have a really long, terrible history with each other of either dominate, kill, subjugate, or ignore, or convert. Those are kind of the options. And now we're finding more and more people in this gathering right here, but I go to these type of gatherings quite often, where people of different religious, contemplative traditions, religious traditions, come together to learn from each other. This is really odd. I mean, we debated with each other for a long time. That's pretty benign. But it's always to win. You lose, I win. I lose, you win. But now actually coming together to learn from each other? This is very unusual. And then science and religion, it's a very complex relationship, but clearly we have these great archetypes of poor Galileo, poor Bruno, poor Darwin, poor, and it's this conflictual relationship, and we've seen it just recently in Dover, Pennsylvania, who somebody won, somebody lost. But now what's happening again in this rather unprecedented way of people very committed to a scientific paradigm and others very committed to various religious or spiritual paradigms coming together not to see who wins and who loses. How can we learn together? How can we learn from each other? And again, for alleviation of suffering, but as Owen and Tutankhamen bring out, can we reconceive and bring out a, f a, f a fresh vision that is ancient and unprecedented of human flourishing? Something that is so important that nobody's got a monopoly. I'm a Buddhist, I think it has a lot to contribute, but so does Martin Seligman, and so does Aristotle, and so do the Taoists, and so do the Vedantins. And that we're actually coming together, this strikes me as being breathtakingly hopeful in the face of an extremely dire, bulky situation. a sense that that was a note to end on. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's stop there. That's a, that's a nice way to do it. But now I'd like to ask Bob Pollack, who is here today, uh, to make a few comments as the director of the CSSR who has uh, hosted this wonderful conference.